A couple of months ago, I got curious about how long health influencers live, so I made an episode about 24 health gurus I was familiar with. One disturbing pattern that emerged was how young the low-carb dieters were when they died. I thought surely that must be a small sample size thing, so last month I did an episode with 60 more and spent a lot of time searching for low-carb influencers. I was encouraged to find people like Dr. Ephraim Cutter, a carnivore who lived to 84, but still the same pattern emerged. That really bothered me. I thought people would legitimately point to low-carb influencers who lived well into their 90s and my credibility would be shot. You scary bitch, didn't you? Show the people you're sponsored by Big Buckley! You biased, mister! So I tripled down on my search and at first I kept discovering the same things. For example, Benjamin Spock became a household name. He looked amazing at 94, but he was vegan. He famously said all children over two years old should be vegan. I was looking for long-lived low-carbers. In this episode, I'll take you on my quest. I found some and I'll end with what I think allows some low-carbers to live long while others die way too young. One thing's for sure, there was a boom in low-carb diets in the 50s and 60s. For example, this is Dr. Stillman's 4 million copy best-selling low-carb diet book published in 1967. There is no instruction to count calories. You can eat as much of the fine foods on the list as you need to satisfy your hunger. A great variety of lean meats, unfatty fish and seafood, chicken and turkey, eggs, cottage cheese, and farmer's cheese. He died of a heart attack at 79. Another was The English Complaint by Dr. Franklin Bicknell, a low-carb diet book that sold well in 1952. He died at 53. Arnold DeVries wrote Primitive Man and His Food in 1952 and died at 74. I can't believe I forgot to mention Carlton Fredericks when I was recording in the kitchen and before I jetted out here to Utah. He was a good friend and mentor to Dr. Atkins and wrote this low-carb diet book in 1965, which was very popular. He had a syndicated radio show for 30 years, five days a week on low-carb dieting. If you are what you eat, I suggest, you're an awful mess. He lived to 76. Also Eustace Chesser, a popular book author who wrote the book Slimming for the Million in 1939. He died at 70. Okay, back to the kitchen. Then there were the paleo diet pioneers. Walter Volklin wrote The Stone Age Diet in 1975 and died at 71. Stoffen Lindeberg wrote Food and Western Diseases and died at 66. Boyd Eaton wrote The Paleo Description and died at 82. And Leon Chaitow, who wrote another Stone Age diet book, died at 81. There were fitness gurus like the bodybuilder Vince Deronda, who wrote the low-carb book Unleashing the Wild Physique in 1977 and died at 79. I even went to more recent books like Carbohydrates Can Kill by Dr. Sue, who died at 71. And there was Forever Young by Dr. Stuart Berger, who loved corned beef sandwiches and champagne, and died at 40. I was beginning to sweat because even reaching out to the low-carb community didn't produce any 90-somethings. But then I caught a break. I discovered the website thinks.org spelled with a C, the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics. It appears to be abandoned with the copyright notice displaying 2014, but they have a public list of over 100 members, some of them best-selling authors. So Google and I went down the list and it didn't look good at first. There was Peter Skrobinek, one of the founding members and author of Follies and Fallacies in Medicine, who died of prostate cancer at 53. Professor Michael Berger, who died at 58, and Joel Kaufman, who co-founded the site and wrote Malignant Medical Myths. He died at 78. But finally, I discovered Austrian physician Dr. Wolfgang Lutz, who wrote My Life Without Bread, which I was able to get on my Kindle. He had an epiphany when visiting cave paintings from France, and he concluded from the paintings that our natural diet must be mostly animals. With all due respect to Dr. Lutz, whom I do admire after reading his book, I wasn't sure caveman paintings represented either everyday food or the healthiest diet. So I consulted with some wall art authorities on how we choose our wall decorations. Yeah, it's not every day my uncle gets his hail moose by a jaguar. He loves paw scratches, belly scratches. Oh. I mean, it's not every day that my grandma stands on the edge of Victoria Falls. What, you think we dress like that every day? <laughs> Dr. Lutz allowed 72 grams of carbs per day, which was three Austrian white bread rolls. You could have one for each meal. But here's the kicker. Each roll was considered two bread units, 12 grams per unit, 
and he has a table of substitutions you could make. For example, pass on a half a roll, 12 grams, and you could have 200 grams of green beans, cabbage, or cauliflower, or a pint of beer, or two glasses of wine, or 120 grams of acid fruit like citrus or berries. Dude, if I passed on my three white bread rolls, I could have two and a half pounds of veggies per day? I'm in. The way he described what he ate, some might even call it a balanced diet with fruit and vegetables at every meal. Lunch was fish and butter with grilled tomatoes and 50 grams of potatoes. Dinner was cold meat and cheese with garlic mushrooms, lettuce and cucumber salad, cold curried rice, fresh berries, whipped cream, a teaspoon of sugar or honey, and a glass of wine. Dr. Lutz lived to 97. I got excited about another doctor I found on the cholesterol skeptics list, Dr. Paul Roche. But it didn't turn out to be a low-carb book, instead advising lots of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. With the boom in low-carb books pre-Atkins, I was trying to remember what the low-carb book was that my dad loved so much in the 60s. Hmm, he loved grilling steaks and drinking scotch. Ah, finally I remembered! The Drinking Man's Diet from 1964 that was so popular. The guy who wrote it was none other than famed photographer Robert Cameron, and he lived to 98. It sold millions of copies, and celebs like Dean Martin embraced it. There were hilarious spoofs about it in the day. Oh, I'm on the drinking man's diet. It came from a book I was low. It's really terrific and quite scientific, and I'm half stoned. So I bought a 50th anniversary edition of this thin little book. Robert didn't know anything about nutrition, but someone had handed him a list of 100 foods that were high in carbs and said, cut those and you'll lose weight. He did, and he went from 205 to 187 pounds. To make sure he wasn't missing something, he visited nutrition professor Agnes Faye Morgan at UC Berkeley, whom he described as slender. She said she had been on the equivalent of the drinking man's diet for 50 years, but she gave him a stark warning. She said, this is very important. You must have 60 grams of carbohydrates daily to stay healthy. She was adamant about this. Lack of the proper amount of carbohydrates will bring you to the unpleasant symptoms of a condition called ketosis. She lived to 84, by the way, so Robert's meals included meat, poultry, and fish, fruits and vegetables, and drinks like martinis and wine with every meal. He explained why he thought the diet worked. Instead of 400 grams of carbohydrates, we're now eating only 60. Incidentally, since every gram of carbohydrate means four calories, this represents a decline of over 1,350 calories in our daily diet, provided the total intake of proteins and fats remains the same. So after all this, I have 100 influencers on my timeline, and it's still not a good look for low-carb diets. Dr. Walter Longo, the respected longevity researcher from USC, cited some well-respected studies concluding that with the high animal protein form of low-carb diets, people were twice as likely to die of any cause. Yeesh, that's in the neighborhood of smoking. And four times as likely to die from cancer. But what do smart, well-educated advocates of low-carb diets say about this? If you've seen my previous episodes, you know I have a strong bias towards doctors and scientists with great credentials. And that led me to a book by doctors Westman, Finney, and Volek. I learned the Atkins diet has evolved and now has vegetarian and vegan options, but the book never addresses longevity. So I watched their speeches. One thing that jumps out at me is how low-carb and vegan doctors are isolated in different conference bubbles with their own set of beliefs. I laugh when I try to imagine what supplement makers would try to sell if vegans and carnivores were at the same conferences. The answer to all your problems is in this little bottle. Vitamita Benjamin. Now you take some. Oh. <laughs> it's so tasty, too. One bubble example is low-carb influencers often talk about ancestral diets, and I often wish we could get a second opinion from career anthropologists. And I put up this picture because this is a photograph, we think it was taken around 1910, it was taken in uh, northern Canada on the Arctic coast. Uh, we know that some of them lived to, to be 70 or 80 years old, so it wasn't a death-dealing diet. Honestly, I wasn't looking for a poorly studied population whose elders lived to 70 or 80, when we have populations all over the world that are thoroughly studied whose elders live past 100. So I went to Dr. Finney's writings and couldn't find any mention of studies about longevity. By the way, Dr. Finney is co-founder of Verta Health, whose valuation during their last round of financing was $1 billion. Their business is treating type 2 diabetes with keto. 
In any case, there seems to be a unique distrust in the low-carb community about large population studies and epidemiologists. I did find a low-carb author, however, Rob Wolf, who gave a speech addressing one of the many large studies that concluded low-carb diets shorten your life. Everybody and their cat jumped in on this thing, BBC, CNN, Newsweek. They quoted the study that really seemed pretty damning. This is the, the paper that came out. It was published in The Lancet. And when these things pop up, the folks in, in the community, um, we, we kind of get on an email chain and they're like, are you going to take this bullet? You, you know, like who's going to jump in and take the, the week or month out of their life to fully unpack this stuff? And, and Chris Kresser ended up drawing the short straw. That took some wind out of my sails because I wasn't looking to go all tobacco company on scientists to find weaknesses in their studies just to cast doubt. I was hoping he would point us to good studies about low-carb dieters who lived long. Every other major diet has those, including vegans and Mediterranean diets and Okinawan dieters. But okay, let's hear Chris Kresser out. Like Rob Wolf, he's not a doctor or scientist, but he too is a low-carb book author. First point, I've been writing about health and nutrition for more than a decade now, and without fail, at least once a year a study like this is published. I could set my watch to it. Is that making the point that Chris wants to make? I'd be tempted to think, huh? If independent teams of scientists from around the world with impeccable credentials keep coming up with the same conclusions year after year, maybe they know things. Second point, repeat after me, correlation is not causation. One of the key things to understand about observational studies is that you can't establish causation from observational studies. That does get repeated a lot in the low-carb community, but is it true? Epidemiology is heavy in statistics and probability theory, and I don't think Chris has a strong background in statistics and probability, and I don't think he's been involved in large-scale observational studies. Epidemiologists are revered when they can infer the causes of the spread of infections in hospitals, for example, and they often have to do it from observational studies because conducting clinical trials would be unethical. You can't create a control group of nurses who don't wash their hands, for example. Epidemiologists have time-honored statistical methods like strength of correlation, propensity scores, and graphical causal models, to name a very few, that quantify causal risks. Here's an example. Suppose you want to know whether smoking is healthy when it appears to many people that it is. You lose weight, it calms your nerves, and you feel good for the first 20 years that you smoke. But into the debate came the two most respected cancer epidemiologists in the world, Sir Richard Dahl and Sir Richard Pito. Smoking is not an easy place for an epidemiologist to be because not many smokers want to hear an academic telling them smoking is unhealthy. In 1950, when they published their results, it was um, received with apathy, anger and disbelief. And you're going to be a target of tobacco companies and they're nasty. So well, clearly we had to approach it by some other method. And the obvious method was what we call, now call a cohort study and to try and see if we could predict who would get lung cancer. So we thought doctors would be a good population to study. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. They ran a 50-year, questionnaire-driven, observational study among doctors that left very little doubt smoking was a risk factor for many diseases. When the results were published in the British Medical Journal, the doctors read the British Medical Journal and thought, my God, this is serious. This doesn't just kill patients, this kills doctors. In 1980, the US Congress commissioned the two celebrated epidemiologists to quantify the causes of cancer in America. No easy job when it would be unethical to expose study participants to cancer-causing substances in clinical trials. They combined the power of observational studies with statistics and probability to estimate that 30% of cancers come from tobacco, 35% come from lack of fruit and vegetables in the diet, and factors like environmental exposures contribute something like 4%. I've heard Professor Pito say it was hard to quantify the balance between smoking and lack of fruits and vegetables because few smokers eat fruits and vegetables, and the few that do eat some fruit have a 30% lower incidence of lung cancer. 35 years on, their estimates seem to be holding as generally true. That's very impressive. Strangely, the low-carb community dismisses epidemiologists when the rest of the nutritional community embraces them. For example, that's one of the reasons that the China study produced such high-quality data, because none other than Richard Pito was one of its key co-authors. And of course, blogger Chris Kresser has tried to discredit that study as well. 
the rest of Chris's blog post about the Lancet study that showed increased mortality among low-carb eaters is interesting. He points out weaknesses in the study. All studies have them. Just ask the tobacco companies about Dole and Pito's studies. But it is useful to understand their limitations. Before COVID struck, I was invited to a Stanford MIT Brain Summit focused on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And the organizing principle was that more often than not, scientific breakthroughs happen when the major disciplines collide. Neurology, biochemistry, psychology, data science, epidemiology, nutrition, etc. I think that if scientific disciplines like epidemiology and anthropology and the science of organizing large, multi-country, multi-decade, huge population studies were not locked out of the low-carb industry, we would have a lot more data to go by. My guess is we would find long-lived low-carb eaters who were healthy, but they would have moved towards plant-based sources of fats and proteins like avocados and nuts. And they would have moved away from animal sources of proteins because epidemiologists have been telling us for decades those are risky. My bet is the chart would look like this. The plant-based form of keto is probably the healthiest. The moderate protein, higher fat version like Finney, Volek, and Westman advocate is probably next. And the high animal protein version is probably what Walter Longo's studies show. Double the risk of dying of all causes and quadruple the risk of dying of cancer. Who really knows, but I assume the processed food version of keto is probably the next worst. Wow, keto-friendly cereal. Wow, I wonder how many people understand those ingredients like allulose coconut keto clusters with brown rice syrup and cane sugar. Mm. White keto bread. We've got resistant tapioca starch. How the heck is white bread even keto? And Atkins sells a line of ultra processed foods with ingredients like milk isolates, polydextrose, and palm oil. And the carnivore version? Well, there's a vegan who's healthy at 90 right now and a quote of his has stuck with me. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Whether you're watching on Plant Based News, who I think is helping save the planet and making us healthy, or on Plant Chompers, I hope you'll like, subscribe, and comment. I read all your comments and learn a ton from you guys.